I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Kathleen Ethier, who is the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Adolescent and School Health in the National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. CDC DASH works to promote environments where youth can gain fundamental health knowledge and skills, establish healthy behaviors for a lifetime, and connect to health services. Prior to her appointment as director of DASH, Dr. Ethier served in a variety of capacities across the agency, where she focused on developing strategic direction for agency priorities, best practices for using data for decision-making, and improving program evaluations. We're so grateful she's with us today to provide a federal perspective on adolescent mental health and share how DASH helps schools support students and improve mental health. Dr. Ethier? Thank you so much for including me in this um, really very important presentation on this increasingly urgent issue. Um, as mentioned, I'm Kathleen Ethier. I'm the Director of the Division of Adolescent and School Health, or DASH, as you will often hear us referred as. And I'm going to give you a brief overview of the division, talk uh, about some important data that frames why we're all here today, and what schools can do to support mental health among youth, and then some findings from our own work in schools. In the Division of Adolescent School Health, um, the vision that guides us is one where all youth have the knowledge, skills, and resources they need, not only during their adolescence, but to help them move into healthy adulthood. As you all know, adolescence is a key time for most health issues, including mental health. Behaviors and experiences start to solidify, setting up the trajectory for the later years. But it's also the last time we have most adolescents together in one place, that is their schools, with the opportunity for wide-scale intervention before they set off into the next phase of their development. So a little bit about how DASH helps. We are currently funded under the Domestic HIV Appropriations Line for CDC, and with those funds we do three things. We provide school district support um, for an approach to improve primary prevention of HIV, other STDs, and teen pregnancy through the prevention of behaviors and experiences, including mental health, that place youth at risk. We do monitoring and evaluation of our district programs as well as tool development and investigation of emerging issues and solutions. And then we also do school-based surveillance of youth behaviors and experiences through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey and school-based policies and practices through our profile system. Mental health is included in our surveillance systems, and we use those as well as other sources of data to monitor the state of adolescent mental health. These data tell us that we are moving toward an increasing mental health crisis among youth in this country. This data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, our biennial school-based survey of high school students, shows that experience of emotional distress and suicide ideation increased significantly between 2007 and 2017, and that almost a third of high school students in 2017 said that they experienced sadness and hopelessness that they were to the extent that they were unable to do their regular activities for at least two weeks in the last year. In addition, SAMHSA's National Survey on Drug Use and Health also shows a significant increase in adolescents reporting major depressive um, episodes from 2017 to 2018, and the percentage of adolescents in 2018 who had a past year MD with severe impairment was also higher than in 20, from 2016, 20, 2006 to 2016. When we start to break this down a little further, we see that the increases in emotional distress are driven primarily by female students, among whom more than 40% in 2017 said that they were so distressed that they could not uh, perform regular activities. We also see that sexual minority students, including those who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, those who are unsure of their sexual identity, and those who have had any same-sex partners bear the brunt of a, both emotional distress and suicide ideation. And here you're, you're seeing the proportion of um, sexual minority youth who have ever attempted suicide in the last 12 months.
We know that the experience of mental health issues during adolescence has implications during those years as well as into adulthood. We know that mental health issues are more likely in youth who have experienced child abuse and neglect, as well as other adverse childhood experiences, like bullying and other forms of violence. Mental health issues cluster with substance use, suicide risk, as well as sexual risk behaviors that place youth at risk for a variety of poor health outcomes. All of these set the stage for further health issues in adulthood, including violence victimization and perpetration, substance use, and suicide. For example, children who experience physical abuse or neglect early in their lives are at greater risk for, violent, for being abused by dating partners as teens. Children who have witnessed parental violence are more likely to bully and act violently towards peers and dating partners, attempt suicide, and abuse their children and intimate partners and perpetrate sexual violence later in life. Fortunately, there are a number of factors, such as school connectedness, that increase children's, families, and communities' resilience and reduce the likelihood of multiple forms of violence from occurring. In our YRBS data, we see that significant proportions of youth experience multiple risks. When we look at the intersection of mental health, violence victimization, what we term high-risk substance use, which is a combination of illicit drug use like heroin or cocaine use, injection drug use, and opioid use, and sexual risk behavior. We see that although a third of students don't have any of these risks, more than a third have at least two, and almost a quarter of students experience both violence victimization and mental health issues. Despite this great need among youth, there are significant gaps in treatment. You can see here that among students who experience each of these issues, including substance use disorder and any mental illness, the bulk, as portrayed with the lighter shading in the bars, do not receive treatment. But we know that schools can play a role in both promoting mental health and providing a pathway for treatment for those who need it. In terms of those adolescents who receive mental health services, 3.4 million adolescents receive those services in an education setting, and here you can see the sky blue line in the chart, exceeded only by specialty mental health settings. So we know that schools can be a, a pathway to service delivery for those with diagnosed mental health needs. But what about the large proportion of youth who either do not yet have a diagnosis or who are not yet experiencing mental health issues? We find it helpful to think about what schools can do, all the way from promoting positive emotional and social and behavioral health supports for all students, referred to as Tier 1 in this pyramid, to more specific sp supports for students at higher risk, or Tier 2, to the, to the Tier 3 supports for students with identified issues that require more intensive intervention. So I want to focus for a few minutes on that Tier 1 approach to talk about what schools can do for all students. From our work in DASH, we know that schools, in addition to academic learning, have the ability to do three things really well that support students if they have the resources to do them. The first is to provide quality health education that is medically accurate, developmentally appropriate, and culturally relevant and inclusive and provides the knowledge and skills as a basis for health decisions and experiences. Second, schools can be a gateway for connections to needed services, both in schools and in communities, including mental and behavioral health services. Third, Schools provide the daily environmental supports for students that can support them and make them feel safe and connected. And this is really what, where I want to spend my last few minutes. School connectedness, or the belief that adults and peers in your school care about you, your progress, and your well-being, has positive impacts both in adolescence and well into adulthood on all of the issues we've been discussing today, including violence, substance use, sexual risk, and mental health. A study that we published last summer using data from the National Longitudinal Survey of Adolescent and Adult Health found that school and family connectedness measured in 7th and 12th through 12th grades can lower the likelihood for all of these health risk behaviors and experiences into uh, the late 20s and early 30s, a 20-year impact. 
both school and family connectedness were also found to be associated with an increased likelihood of graduating from college. So the impact of school connectedness is wide and deep. And we know how to increase school connectedness. In our work with school districts across the country, we ask them to put a set of activities in place in their middle schools and high schools to improve connectedness. We ask them to provide professional development on classroom management and put policies and practices in place that support youth during that through classroom management. We ask school districts to implement school-based positive youth development programs um, or connect programs, students to programs in their community. So the two um, aspects here are we bring mentoring programs into the schools and then we also connect students out to do service learning in their communities. We also have established the importance of student-led clubs that, that support LGBTQ youth. We also know the importance of family engagement and so have, have asked our districts to work to improve family connectedness by sharing resources with families about positive parenting practices like monitoring and communication. And what we find is that when middle schools and high schools put these practices in place, we see positive impacts. From 2014 to 2018, when CDC funded districts that implemented school connectedness strategies, we saw declines in negative health behaviors and experiences among students, including reduced sexual risk behavior, reductions in substance use, reductions in violence victimization, and improvements in mental health and reductions in suicide ideation. We also know that this kind of primary prevention work does not need to break the bank. Both the, that program and our current five-year program, which, do, which um, implement the same activities, reach about 2 million students a year and cost less than $10 per student. In summary, mental health among adolescents is a critical public health issue. It is becoming increasingly evident from data and from what schools are telling us that youth are experiencing higher levels of emotional distress. And it is going to take more than just public health working on this issue to make an impact. The good news is that primary prevention saves lives and money. We're not talking about standalone curriculum. We're talking about programs, policies, and practices that improve school climate and in turn help youth feel more connected in their schools. We know that school connectedness improves student outcomes. We've seen this through our own programs as well as a wide body of research. Schools are key to this work. There is strong evidence that tells us that schools are a place to do effective primary prevention. It is time for us to make sure that this is happening in more schools. And so if you walk away with one thing from this webinar today, please keep in mind that there is real power in schools and their ability to implement primary prevention. Our nation, nation's youth need help, and we have the tools to start providing that. I encourage you all to learn more about how your school district is doing. Our most recent national YRBS data will be released in August. In the meantime, look at your profiles data, see if your district or state collects youth risk behavior and surveillance data, and utilize the tools that we provide on our website to implement strategies that will make schools more supportive spaces. And our contact information is here, and you are welcome to visit our website to find out about any of the resources that we provide. Thank you very much.